this day. Thank you for this chance to gather, to dwell on your word. Indeed, Lord, how beautiful and delightful on the mountains are the feet of him who bring good news, who announce peace, who bring good news of good things, who announce salvation, who says to Zion, your God brings. Thank you, dear Lord, for all your messengers, your messengers of peace, all those who have brought the word into our lives, all those who have gone ahead with their yes to bring your word into our minds, our hearts, our homes. And we lift up to you this morning to hear your word, to listen to your word, and to do your word. All these we pray in your sweet and mighty name. Amen. Good morning, CTK. Morning. I need permission to share screen. So, um, it's good to be back in CTK, you know, so to see the missionaries of Christ the King. It's sort of a homecoming for me, because uh, this is also where, in this parish, this is where I first heard the word of God, and the seed was planted, the seed of the missionary was planted in me. So, uh, missionaries of CTK, uh, of Christ the Missionary King, how has your journey been this Lent? Uh, we're halfway through Lent. Uh, sorry. We're halfway, we are three weeks into Lent. For me, all right, the fruit of the Ash Wednesday recollection uh, was really to become more aware, to listen to Jesus saying, I thirst, uh, to go back, to keep going back to that experience at the well when Jesus uh, spoke to the Samaritan woman. And recently, I had a, a very real experience of this, I thirst. Now, last week, I went to Singapore for a medical conference. So it was my first time to go out overseas for a, a conference since the pandemic. And I'm really up, up now. So, so when I arrived in the hotel, there were two small bottles of water. So my agenda for that first day in Singapore was to buy water. So we went shopping. I bought a liter, one dollar lang naman, <laughs> one Singapore dollar, one a, a big bottle of water. So I go, this will last me na the whole the whole week. And then the first day of the conference, they give us our conference kit. You know, in medical conference, they like giving us things. And in that kit, there was a five hundred ml of water. It's free, totally free. So. So I said, oh, okay, I don't, I, I don't need to conserve water. So I put that big 500 ml in my small ref in the hotel, and I drank water freely the rest of No issues with water. So I plan to bring that water to the airport because I'm afraid I don't like getting thirsty. So I had my free bottle of water, and I had the foresight to bring it to the airport. But of course, when we landed in the airport, Shopping, <laughs> last minute shopping. I have my coffee, I have to buy it. Then I have to have last minute snacks. Now I have to have my Kaya toast before flying out of Singapore. <laughs> so, of course, I forgot all about my water. <laughs> I forgot to drink that water. And of course, when I passed through the last security check, what happened to my water? <laughs> it got confiscated. <laughs> and when I sat down in the plane, it hit me. I'm thirsty. I'm thirsty. <laughs> so I had that experience of thirst, of real thirst on the plane, even though I had my free bottle of water and I had the foresight to bring it. This past week, we've all received this invitation to enter the desert, to be with Jesus, to journey together, to walk with and accompany Jesus. And freely, Freely, freely given to us by these truths of faith and the means to follow Jesus. And we, we're all here. You know, we have the foresight to take action, to go out and hear and do the word. Now, fill up your bottle to partake of the transformative, that transfigurative power of your daily vitamin P, your daily prayer, fasting, almsgiving. Because we know we know that in these weeks to come, we will encounter um, thirsty Jesus. He will hear his thirst, 
his eye thirst at Gethsemane on the road to Calvary at the foot of the cross. Last week and last um, Sunday, our prayer, our, our gospel reading centered on, on quite a dramatic scene. So uh, last week we watched Jesus cleansing the temple and challenging the chief priests to destroy the temple of his body. And he promised he will raise it up again. How's this? Okay. This week, our setting is much quieter, less drama, with just two characters. And this occurs in the dead of the night, in a secret place. This is the encounter of Nicodemus and Jesus. Nicodemus was thirsty to know the Lord more. He followed Jesus, but in secret. That's why the meeting was at night and uh, in secret. Uh, Nicodemus was a Pharisee. He was a leader of the Jews. So people were watching his every move. What will he do with this Jesus? And sometimes I think of myself a, a little bit like Nicodemus, in a sense that Nicodemus was not yet all in. He needed convincing. So there's a part in me, maybe in all of us, which maybe still does not believe. And this was really a one-on-one -on -one meeting between Jesus and Nicodemus, a very personal meeting, face-to-face, heart-to-heart, a meeting of two thirsts. Jesus has something very personal to reveal to Nicodemus. And today, as we pray, Jesus has something personal to reveal to each one of us here. So today, this coming week, our, the invitation is our prayer will center on preparing for a very personal encounter with our missionary king. Yes, thirsty, but also bloody, bruised, and broken. Soon, Jesus is about to enter his passion. The temple of his body will undergo much suffering. And as missionaries, we prepare our minds and hearts to come close and see and touch the wounded Christ. So the gospel was already read earlier. Thank you, Father Givano. And our prayer will focus on just the first verses of, of the reading. Again, we have Jesus speaking these words to Nicodemus in the night. Allow me to just read the first three verses. We start with verse 14. John 3, verse 14. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish but may have eternal life. Just a brief, Michael instructed me to introduce, I have a formal introduction as well. I'm Resty, and this is my wife. My wife is here. Her name is Cecilia. And we have one son, Satina, who's 16 years old. So, uh, Cecilia and yeah, 16 now. <laughs> Cecilia and I, we are a missionary married couple of the Berman Day fraternity. We are in formation. You know, so, we are missionaries in the making. Uh, so... Um, Santino, he's a uh, little saint. Santino means little saint. No, but he's also a missionary. You know, he's also a missionary. Primarily, he's a missionary to us. Yeah? So he's a messenger of God's love for us at home. I mean, we need to teach us a lot of things about the love of God, right? especially in conversation. He has all these questions. And I always hear, I'm always the bystander, you know? like Nicodemus and Jesus. You know? I'm always the bystander when Cecilia and Santino are, are talking. Uh, so, and that's sometimes, that's nice. sometimes that's how I really pray. I pretend I'm in the scene where you can pretend that you're in, in the scene with Jesus and Nicodemus listening and listening to their personal conversation. Uh, so, and um, they call me Dr. ST. Yes, I'm a doctor. Uh, so, Cecilia's a teacher. She's a director of a school called Antioch School Manila. So uh, one cliche about being a doctor is uh, we, if we cannot stand the sight of blood, 
then you cannot be a doctor. Okay. That's is that true? You know? But for me, it is not not a big deal. The sight of blood is is not hard for me. And the bloodiest sight that I have ever seen. So I was a med student, and you, I was on duty in the emergency room, and uh, uh, a car crash victim is wheeled in. He's this big man, big big man, you know, and he, he had crush injuries. You know, so. So very quickly, we were doing all the stuff. That I, I was just like the lowest in the hierarchy of, of doctors attending to that. So I got the, the, the smallest job <laughs> with the catheter. Yeah, so I was doing catheter. And then the surgeons who were managing the case, they had crush injuries. And it's really, really uh, bad car accident. So um, so they cut open his, because uh, he has crush here. So you cannot do chest compressions. Like, can I, I missed the camera. He cannot do chest compressions. Yeah, so uh, to, to revive his heart. So what they did, they cut open, and then they they cramped open his ribs. And then the surgeon, he got my hand, and then he put it inside. He put it inside. He put it inside the chest. And I was a that so then he knows nothing. No? Put it inside the chest, and he struck me, I have to do cardiac compressions. Cardiac compressor. <laughs> and and this is the time before PPE pan. So all the blood, the blood was all over my arm, all over my shoes. And then from the ER to the third floor operating room, I was doing cardiac compression, cardiac compression, cardiac compression. But we reached the operating room. So the sight of blood is is really easy for me. So but when it comes to seeing Jesus, have, I suppose most of you have seen uh, Passion of the Christ. So, and then I remember the first time I watched that movie, I think I was closing my eyes <laughs> most of the time. I was just holding Jesus and closing my eyes. I, I could not watch. I could not look. Looking at the wounds of Jesus, the wounding, the suffering of Christ, it's not easy for me. It may not be easy for you. But Jesus has a very personal request for his disciples. Jesus asks you to stay. Stay awake for one hour. To be with Jesus in his agony, stay close. Smell his sweat and blood. Jesus asks you to listen to his urgent cry of, I thirst. Jesus asks you to see his wounds, the wounds of his body today. In our discipleship and mission, we are to look, look at the wounds. And it's really important to be real, to look at the reality. Pope Francis once said that listening is letting ourselves be struck by reality. Pope Francis says, have a dialogue with reality. Look around you. Look at what's real. In our missionary life, Jesus asks us to see reality, the very real wounds of his body. So I shared Cecilia is the director of a school. So she started a small preschool 17 years ago. So that's where our son goes to school. So, and this past year has really been quite troubling. Our hearts are always trembling and always in fear and anxiety. And this uh, late last year, we came to a very painful decision that we, we needed to close the school. So our, our school is closing after 17 fruitful years. It really is a wound for me. <laughs> it really is a wound because I see that it's really Cecilia's life mission, you know, and it's really a, a field, a mission field, you know? families and children hearing the word of God and knowing Jesus, you know, discovering so much about Jesus, and just like our son. That's why I did not pay. <laughs> My son goes to that school. <laughs> you know, but it's really, really a, a big wound. And then I was praying for this, for these guidelines. And I realized, I, I thought I was okay or <laughs> Because we've been praying, we've been praying about it since last year. Many of you have been praying with us, and I thought I was okay. 
but it's still a wound. And in a way, I don't want to look at it. I don't want to see it maybe just yet. So today, Jesus is asking a very personal question. What are your wounds? And what wounds in the body of Christ do you see? What are your wounds? What wounds in the body of Christ do you see? So Jesus, we come to the well thirsty. We ask for the grace to stay, to listen to your urgent cry of, I thirst, to open our eyes to the wounds of your body today. So to look at the wounds of Christ is not easy. So allow me to share what helped me in my prayer. John 3, 14 to 15 begins with, and Jesus, imagine Jesus speaking these words to Nicodemus. So you can be a uh, bystander listening, or you could also be Nicodemus. So Jesus says this to us. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. Thus missionaries, as messengers of God, our ears will be open to hear, I thirst, and our eyes will be open to see the wounds of the body of Christ today. And we are the body. We are the body. As followers of Christ, we form one body, one body of believers and disciples. We are one in our faith, one in mission. We, though many, are one body in Christ and individually members one of another. Romans 12, verse 5. And Christ is our missionary king, the head of the body. We are one body with Christ as the head. He is the head of the body, the church. Colossians 1, 18. So, when we look at the wounds, again, this is not easy. We must look to the head. Hebrews 12 verse 2 says, fix your eyes on Jesus, the missionary king. And Jesus speaks to Nicodemus about the instructions to the Jews in the desert. Remember, Nicodemus is a Jew. He knows all about this. And Jesus compares himself with Moses. Moses was a messenger, an agent of God, a savior. God's people. And we all know the story. The Israelites in the desert, they were complaining, complaining, complaining about going to 40 years in the desert, I remember. And they were punished by a plague of serpents. And many of them, after being by the serpent, they died. And at God's instructions, Moses crafted a bronze serpent on a pole. And whenever a serpent bit someone, that person will look at the serpent of bronze and live. Look and live. Look and live. So the instructions to the Jews in the desert, once you're bitten, wounded, look to the serpent and you will live. In the same way, when we are wounded, when we are looking at the wounds of the world today, when we are looking at Jesus wounded, at the body of Christ, when we look at each other, see wounds. We are to look at the Son of Man lifted up. Fix your eyes on Jesus. So look at the wounds. Look at Jesus. Look at Jesus. Look and live. One time when I was, again, med student, you know, so I was in the surgical OR, outpatient. You know, so the patient came in. You know, he has a a uh, relatively middle-aged man, he had a bupal on his, a little lump on his forehead. Not really a bad kind of tumor, man, but it's really cosmetic. No? He wanted it removed. So I was assigned to his case. So I was very confident. Tiga po kayo, relax lang po. So lying down, I cleaned everything, I draped, I did everything by the book. Everything, everything. No? So the drape covered his face a little bit. No? So I covered. Oh, Start the and then I started cutting very slowly. I cut, and then I cut, and then it, it occurred to me, there's no sound. The bit, he wasn't saying anything, wasn't saying anything. But when I lifted the drape, I saw his face. 
His face was. I forgot to put anesthesia. <laughs> okay lang po. Okay lang po. Maglagay lang po tayo anesthesia. <laughs> Don't forget to look at your patient's face. Don't forget. Look. Look at the wound. Look. Look at the patient's face. That was, I was a med student. Uh, these days, these days, every month, I consult, every month, I go to a very famous plastic surgeon. Every month, without fail, I go to this plastic surgeon. So, he's a, really an expert on wound care. You know this plastic surgeon. <laughs> His name is Father James. He's one of the missionaries. So, and whenever I, when I tell him all my, when I, um, when I see things that are not good, you know, when I tell him, when I pour out my heart, um, he always gives me that advice. He's, he's really an expert on wound care. He always says to me, look at the head of the body. You know, fix your eyes on Jesus. Be real. You know, look at the reality, yes. But when you look at the reality, always, always look to Jesus. And last December, I will, Last December was our homecoming. You know? So I graduated from med school in 1998. So we had our 25th year homecoming last uh, December. So I was sharing with Father James my whole experience of the homecoming, which was really a whole year of activities, you know? of the pomp and the glam and all that. You know? It's really a big, big event. You, know? you only graduate, uh, you only celebrate 25 years once in your life. Anyway. But I was sharing with him that um, 25 years. I've been working 25 years as a doctor. Um, most of that is in the Philippine General Hospital. So it's a public hospital. You know? And it's really a lot of service working in a broken, broken healthcare system. So, I mean, the problems of many problems have been solved. Many things are better, you know? but many things are the same. You know, we still treat the sickest of the sick, we still take care of the poorest of the poor. And I think after 25 years of looking at that brokenness, I was sharing with Father James, I was really drained of compassion. So when Cecilia says, let's go out and do some outreach for the poor, no, I don't like to go to the poor. I see the poor every day. <laughs> I don't like anymore. When I see someone begging on the street, I, I give all my time to PGH. No more, no more. No more. No, it's, it's, my heart really turned to stone. And James, when I was sharing with that with him, his prescription, again, was look to the head. Look to the head. The head is the source of medicine. Jesus, the good doctor, who saw the people like sheep without a shepherd. And when I see Jesus looking at us, broken, looking at our world, broken systems. But in his eyes, I see the, sh the shepherd looking at his sheep, his lost sheep. And in my prayer, a little bit, <laughs> I think, there's that melting of my heart. There's that Jesus draws me into his heart, his compassionate heart. So when we look upon the face of Jesus, this land. So our instruction is, as missionaries, we look at the world, our reality. We need to hear, I thirst, we need to see the wounds. When you see the wounds, you look to Jesus. But we are in Lent. And so when we look upon Jesus, this land, what do we see? It's an extra challenge, because now we're going to see Jesus bruised, bloody, crowned with thorns. When it's Christmas, it's easy. It's easy to look at Jesus. It's in a crib. It's wonderful. I look at the wounds of the world. But I look at Jesus. Wonderful. Because he's a baby. So it's happy. But as missionaries in a broken world, especially this land, we are invited to look at the suffering Christ. And what helped me in my prayer when I was preparing for these guidelines is that I understood that Jesus is very aware that I want to close my eyes. It's too hard for me. And when I see my own life, 
my sin, my brokenness, when I see the bruised, bloody, and broken world around me, Jesus reminds me of my prayer three weeks ago on Ash Wednesday, that Jesus thirsts, Jesus thirsts for these things, the sour wine. Jesus asked for it, the sour wine of my life and the world. And in my prayer, I asked Jesus, so Jesus, when I look at the wounds of the world, and then I look at you wounded, what do you want me to see? What do you want me to see when I see, when I look at their suffering? What is the message behind the suffering? In my prayer, I understood that in his great suffering, Jesus wants to reveal the great love of his Father. Jesus continues to tell Nicodemus, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. God so loved the world. God loved. God gave his son. So where there is a son, there is a father. You could have answered mother, you know, but that, the correct answer is father. <laughs> when there is a son, there is a father. Okay, when there is a father. So, a few weeks ago, I was praying about uh, Peter. We celebrated the, the chair of Peter a few weeks ago. So, and I was praying about, oops, what did Peter get right? What did Peter get right when Jesus asked him this very personal question? He asked him, who do you say that I am? Matthew 16, 15. Who do you say that I am? And Peter's first answer was, you, Jesus, are the Messiah. So Peter recognized that he needed a savior. He needed someone to save him. He needed saving. And this is what Jesus came to do, to save us. That's his job. But Peter had a second answer. Second answer was, you are the son of the living God. You are the son. Peter recognized that Jesus was all about this relationship. Jesus was son. God was father. And this is the very identity of Jesus. And this is why Peter earned his gold star. The, the right answer, Peter, I am the son. I am the Son. And the Son, Jesus, prayed, prayed for all those called to be his followers and disciples. For us, for each one of us here, called to mission. His prayer was, Righteous Father, the world does not know you, but I know you. And these, Jesus is referring here to the apostles, but also these, us, everyone else who comes after. And these know that you have sent me. The Father sent Jesus. He's a messenger of the Father. I made your name known to them, and I will make it known. Father, I made your name. I revealed you to them, and I will make it known. Jesus will make it known. We will know the Father. And in Matthew 11, verse 27, Jesus again says to his disciples, No one knows the Father except the Son, and those to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Jesus came for us to see the Father, and he wants us to reveal the Father. Jesus was a messenger of the Father. And in the same way, we are called to be messengers of the Father. So in my prayer, I kept asking Jesus, so what is the message? What is the message behind the suffering? The Father is the message. The Father is the message. So today, when I look at the suffering Christ, what is Jesus showing me about the Father? What is Jesus showing me about the Father? So this picture is Santino. Um, this was a few years ago. This is the first time we, had, we attended the Easter encounter 
in Cagayan de Oro. So, um, that's when you know we were doing the Way of the Cross, and I was the one helping. Young people of today live in a broken, broken world. Many of you are parents here, so uh, yes, <laughs> young people today live in a broken world. As a Tino comes home, we have these many, many discussions. Now, he's very passionate about, um, for example, I'm I'm so stressed because in my in my Instagram, I don't want to put they them. I want to put he him. <laughs> I want you know, so all this all this the rise of gender ideology, you know, so, and all this confusion about people want to be called they, them, you know, not her, she, but those things. You know, and and you know, really comes to our dinner table <laughs> with these things. So, I mean we have to process it. You know. Most of the time I'm just listening you now because the serious <laughs> process it. <laughs> I'm I'm the Peace Nicodemus talking to Jesus, uh, but uh, yeah, and and families, the families, marriage is being redefined. Santino has classmates with very serious mental health issues. Now they are suicidal, and my first instinct is really to try to shield. If I were pedi bang ako na lang, although I I don't know how I would deal with this broken broken world, pedi bang ako na lang. And when Santino is about six or seven, again, I'm just a, a spectator in this scene. No? After Cecilia was reading him a book about Jesus and the cross, right? he was really young. No? Santino had this question. Why didn't God just be the one to die on the cross? Why did it have to be Jesus? And Cecilia's brilliant answer. <laughs> She said, the father so loved us that he sent his only son. Imagine, as a parent, it was just as hard, even harder, for the father to watch Jesus suffer. Even harder, because no parent would want to watch their child die. And of course, Satino is going out into the world. He's graduating from school this year. He's going to senior high college very soon. And we hope and pray, we hope and pray that, and we trust that he will make right decisions as he goes out into the world. In a very real way, Satina is our message to the world. And each one of us here, we also are messengers. We are missionaries. Just as the Father sent his most precious missionary, his most precious messenger, the Father sent Jesus 2,000 years ago to reach out to people with their wounds and to tell them, to tell them about God's love for them. So in our life as missionaries, Jesus also asks us to see, and not just see, but also to touch the wounds of his body. Jesus will take your hand and place it into his side. We are sent to touch the wounds as messengers, missionaries, just as God sent Jesus to tell the world of his love, the greatest love the world has known. It's a song. And Pope Francis tells us, uh, this is Pope Francis and Satina. Uh, so we have a Pope who will hug you. And he does, he, these words are very real. For, these are not empty words for our Pope, uh, for our, the Father of our Church. We, we must touch the wounds of Jesus, caress them. We must heal the wounds of Jesus with tenderness. We must literally kiss the wounds of Jesus. And when we touch the wounds and keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, Jesus wants us to see, touch, taste the great love of his Father. God, our Father, who is rich in mercy because of the great love he had for us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, our Father brought us to life 
with his son, Jesus Christ. So we pray, we pray with Mary. We pray with Mary, our mother. Mary, who soothed the scrapes and aches of the child Jesus with great tenderness. Mary, who held the bruised, bloody, and broken body of Jesus with great sorrow. Mary, who touched the wounded hands and feet and side of the risen Christ with great, great joy. Dear Mama Mary, help us to believe and teach us to touch the wounds of the body of Christ today. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.